a shot play Anthony Woods, a man who's on death row, has been on death row for about 15 or 16 years, falsely accused of killing a police officer. And right now, at this particular point in the film where we meet him, we are finding him advocating for clemency as his time for execution is nearing. So in this, uh, I remember when I first read the script and, 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 and sort of the pitch book, the pitch deck rather, that was sent to me by uh, Chinoya Chuku and then Bronwyn Cornelius, the producer. Um, Chinoya, of course, everybody knows, writer, director. Um, I thought that she did, did a brilliant job with exploring the emotional taxation on both characters, primarily when it comes to the warden, played by Alfred Woodard, and then uh, myself also exploring the relevant voices around them. You know, the lawyer, my lawyer, played by Richard Schiff, uh, Danielle Brooks, who plays an estranged, uh, say, lover from the past, you know, who um, they have a history there. You know, I don't, I don't want to give it away, but I thought that she made everybody's voice valid and relevant to the overall point of this this film you know which is for us as the audience to explore how we feel about capital punishment that is it really justified do we have the right to be a part of this um and what does it make of us as, as human beings how does it affect our humanity individually so research started with talking to uh Shinoya about how she felt and how she came about getting to this point with the story and then she told me about troy davis who whose case uh his execution and the effects afterwards sparked her curiosity for, for wanting to tell this story um, because of all the wardens, the prison wardens that wrote out in support of his innocence at the same time wrote about the negative effects that this whole system has on the, not only the, the prisoners, but the wardens, the guards, Ed, the families, everybody, right? Um, went to San Quentin with uh, producer Bronwyn and uh, saw how the, death row inmates were treated, how starkly different they were treated versus the other inmates. The thing that was most strange for me was that when the prisoners, the death row inmates were transferred across the yard, the other prisoners were made to turn their backs and not look at them or speak to them. So I felt like it was crazy how, how inhumane their existence was and how isolated it actually was down to, uh, you know, um, their last days, leading up to their last days. So uh, yeah, just went into that. And then after a while, I, I sort of shaped what my, my, my perspective was, my, my goal with this character was really to try to get the audience to empathize with the human being. I wanted them to see a man before they saw a criminal. I wanted them to see his humanity beyond the setting that he was in, to see if they would be able to empathize with him and, and make a real assertion of who this person was and what his value is um, versus the idea that, oh, you're a criminal, you're bad, so da 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 you know. What I wanted him to do, uh, what I wanted my character Anthony to do this entire film was to search for, assess, and find his own humanity and his own value because it was being stripped away. And that scene where Alfred is explaining how uh, Anthony's gonna die. It's like, how do you have that conversation? How do you process that information? Someone's telling you how you're gonna die. And this is a normalized thing when it comes to this environment. So what I wanted him to do was in that moment, search through his life and search for his humanity. I wanted him to, to figure it out. And I wanted the audience to figure it out with him. I wanted them to also see somebody who was valuable and regardless of what went on, is deserving of consideration. It was a challenge as an actor to get to some of these places because there is an isolation to it. And that's the thing I loved about it was I got to work out a lot. You know, I was in the gym with my acting skills um trying to reach some of these places and, and make people feel something i hadn't 
regarded her being a woman as as anything that could take away from from the process it wasn't something that sparked in my mind i looked at the, the work that she put out and it was great and if the work is great then i'm i'm good to go because you know having a male director doesn't give me any more or less confidence if it's if it's i'll just be real with you if, if the product is trash if their skills are not great or up to par <laughs> i'm not with it <laughs> you know what i'm saying um you know, I think that women do need a spotlight because yes, being a woman in the industry is used against uh, them when it comes to a, the negotiating table of saying, well, who's gonna, you know, there's an old attaboy mentality sometimes, you know, just like there's uh, that same mentality when it comes to black and brown people, you know, black and brown leads, you know, across the board, there's still like, aside from the overwhelming amount of executives, directors, and producers who are not black and brown, like most of the leads on television, I think it's around like between 80 to 88% still white in television and film, you know, and you gotta ask what is the aversion to black and brown when you look around the, and, and I'm talking about, when I say black and brown, I'm, look, really let's just say everybody who ain't white. What is the aversion to, Putting these people in position, leading positions, when that is what the world looks like, right? America sets the tone for leadership when it comes to cinema, and and they need to do a better job of representing what the rest of the world actually looks like if they want to tell these stories. So as it relates to women, I don't ever look at the idea of the director being a woman as a fault. Uh, or, 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 or deficit. I, I look at it as I look at the person dealing with the person directly as an artist. And where is your view, your perspective on this? I think the strength that we get from a female perspective is a nuanced view of a world that we may both see, but we see differently. And now it's a chance for me to learn how to look at something um, with a bit more of a speculative eye, mm -hmm. you know. Um, another thing is that, you know, of course, all women are different. So to, to judge the idea of a female director, not necessarily having the skill set to do something again, it's a patriarchal and, and ignorance that, uh, substantiates one's idea that women are not equal or capable, yeah. which I, I just don't. I don't dig into so you know with with uh Chinoya, i knew that her skill set was there i had never seen her direct before mm -hmm. and that was where the trust had to really go because i hadn't seen her directing but when she, the fact that she wrote the script mm -hmm. and she knew it so well and it was so impactful i was like you know i'm gonna trust the process and we're gonna see what happens i'm, I'm gonna just roll the dice and bet on it and you know it, it was it was a good bet it's a great bet. I think I saw the very first time I saw the film, I was at my uh, agent's building in, in Los Angeles. I was there, a couple of my agents, my manager, my family. And, uh, you know, my first time watching any of my work is always more of a mechanical thing. I'm always sitting back to see how the beats were hit and did I do my job? Did the film come out like I thought it should have, you know? And I personally, I, I really loved it. I was very happy with what the film turned out to be. And then I look around and, you know, there's people in the back crying and all that. And I was like, all right, so we, we touched some hearts. Um, the second time I saw it was actually at Sundance and that was a very different experience because we got a standing ovation at the end. Um, I mean, it's quiet for a minute, don't get me wrong. People are just sitting there quietly, sit with it for a bit. <laughs> and then you get the standing ovation, which was uh, a pleasant surprise. Um, I believe the third time that I saw it was in LA at, at one of the screenings. Um, for awards consideration and just to see how people are, are similarly affected by it was uh, educational. 
you know, a lot of the same stories came out with people saying, I had to sit with it for a minute. I had to be silent in my car or go around the block and just stand there for like 10, 15 minutes and, and, and figure out how it, I had to process it, you know, and, and that's when you know your art is, is dug deep, which for me was the whole point of this. I want people to see how they feel about this particular subject. Mm -hmm. No, no, I think um, I did this film initially because I thought it could be an asset to the constant conversation that we have to have when it comes to what justice actually is and what justice should be. You know, they, people who, who think the justice system is wrong need to open their eyes and realize that we've been taught, we've been deceived into what our definition of justice is versus the reality. The justice system is built perfectly, it's working perfectly. This is how it was meant to work, you know. Well, as, it, as, it, as it regards, in, in regards to policing, policing I know in America, policing here started initially from slave catching. So, you know, imprisonment has evolved, modern day imprisonment has evolved from um, enslavement. Uh, indentured servitude, enslavement, which went to indentured servitude, which is to where it is now. Um, so we're still having the same conversation, finding the same fight. We're just dealing with things that have evolved to what most people would deem to be culturally appropriate. Yes. So in regards to this, yes, capital punishment, why do we need it? Why do we have to have it? Why does it disproportionately affect black and brown people far more than it does white people. Um, I was dealing with a couple of institutions, civil, uh, civil rights institutions, and asking questions about this and said, how does this disproportionately affect um, black and brown people? And they said, you know, on the side of the actual color of the prisoner, there's effects, but where it's, it's most effective is the color of the victim. When it comes to black and brown victims, you know, primarily forgotten, nameless, or as a term coined by police, NHI, no human involved when a black and brown person is killed. That, that means that they say no human involved at times, which is a very um, racist way of saying your life didn't matter. Um, but when it comes to white victim, white victims make up the majority of cases that are taken to to uh, death row you know typically is a white victim again another way for the system to say that white people matter more than or white lives matter more in that way than and um when you do the research and you break it down you, you figure out why we are where we are and why we're having the conversations we do today why we keep needing to say because you know these aren't the common facts that a lot of people uh deal with or want to deal with so you know, I think that right now, if it can be an asset to helping us understand the disparity and inequality and hopefully get to a place of real progress and change, great, you know, because um, that is actually, you know, I, I was just saying this earlier, that has been my primary focus of stress through this entire time. Not necessarily, it's not the quarantine or the COVID, it's the racism. <laughs> you know, that is a far greater threat to me and my existence and my family than anything else ever will be or ever has been uh, in, in my lifetime in this country. It, it's always ever present, it's never gone away. Um, so yeah, any, anything that I can be a part of that would help have the conversation, I'm down for. <laughs>